On a blue background, a man in a wheelchair hangs upside down with his arms stretched to the side. With white text reading, hashtag, nobody is disposable, sins invalid. The Longmore Institute on Disability Superfest and Making Change Media for the hashtag nobody is disposable summer film series. Also sponsored by the San Francisco Senior and Disability Action, Sins Invalid, the hashtag nobody is disposable coalition, the California Care Rationing Coalition, Fat Rose, Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, and the Detroit Disability Power. Welcome back, everyone. We're gonna give folks a couple of seconds to join us before we get started. Hopefully you were able to watch the full film, Unashamed Claim to Beauty by Sins and Valid. My name is Bianca Loriano, and I am a light-skinned Afro-Latina with big curly hair cascading down my head and all around me. And I'm wearing gold-rimmed cat-eyed glasses and a pink dress. And I will be moderating today's panel. So welcome. We're so excited to have you join us for this amazing conversation. I have a very special announcement. For the first time live, we are announcing that Sins Invalid will be having a fall virtual performance. The performance is titled, We Love Like Barnacles, Crip Lives and Climate Chaos. It will be held on October 23rd through the 25th, 2020. And I will be one of the performers slash MCs, and I'm overjoyed and a little bit nervous to be part of this amazing legacy. If you'd like to learn how to participate in viewing the fall performance, please sign up for the Sins Invalid newsletter for updates. We are posting that link in the chat box, so you'll be able to access that shortly. Also, we will be having an audience question and answer period. So if you have any questions, please put them in the question and answer box and we will do our best to answer your question. So we are going to begin with Nomi Lamb. And Nomi is the creative director of Sins and Valid. And I'd like to invite Nomi to join us and turn her camera on and her microphone on as well. Hello. Hi. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Nomi, could you um, give us an audio description of yourself, please? Yeah, I'm a fat, white, Jewish, um, non-binary femme person. I have dark, kind of messy hair with a bun on top. I'm wearing shiny gold eyeshadow and shiny gold earrings that are kind of shaped like feathers and have a dark uh, like sundress that has kind of confetti um, pattern on it. And I'm in a very busy room. This is my bedroom. There's a lot going on around me, plants and animal skulls and feathers and gold things. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Nomi. And Nomi, you're in a leadership role at the organization Sins Invalid. Um, and SINS is an organization that mentored me into disability justice um, via the first disability justice primer, um, the first edition. The second edition is available now. We'll send some links in the chat box later. But I'd like to invite you, Nomi, to share with us uh, what is disability justice? Great. Um, yeah, so disability justice is a framework that was developed started being developed probably almost 15 years ago between queer disabled women of color, including Patty Byrne, who is our co-founder and executive director and artistic director, and you saw her a lot in the film. Um, so conversations between Patty and Stacy Milburn and Mia Mingus, and then other queer and trans and non-binary disabled people and disabled people of color, and the the questions that they were grappling with were around how to make a how to form become a disability movement that went beyond a rights-based framework and 
was looking more at the intersections and the reality that in any community there are disabled people and in disabled community there are queer people and people of color and non-binary people and trans people and so the ways that disability rights had been so single issue focused and really kind of prioritized certain disabled perspectives um, they were complicating that and making it a more compelling movement i think for a lot of us and then since then it's become um you know there's just so many people who have felt so recognized by that new framework and stepped into it including yourself and i just want to show the new disability justice primer this is the second edition it's called skin tooth and bone the basis of movement is our people and it's got um like a, what I call a crip flower. It's like a dahlia that grew in a unique way, a kind of bent spine, and then some octopus tentacles. And um, it's a spiral bound book, which makes it more accessible to be able to open and hold in a way where it's not gonna try to close on you. And um, it has a lot of information about the history of disability justice, including timelines and the 10 principles of disability justice, and then how to bring those more into people's activism and organizing as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nomi. And I just want to note for our participants and viewers that Nomi is joining us today in place of Patty Byrne, the Executive Director of Sins Invalid. And Patty sends her regrets for not joining us today. And I'm overjoyed to have Nomi with us. And I'd love to invite Nomi to also share with us a little bit of the origins of the phrase, no body is disposable and what that message is about. Yeah, I think that is something that Patty could definitely speak to more in depth. But what I do know is that um, that framework or that that name, nobody is disposable, kind of as a tagline or ha hashtag, was created um, in as they were as Patty and then also Stacy Melbourne, who is a beloved, recently transitioned crip ancestor now. Um, who was a queer disabled person of color. Um, the two of them did a series of videos for the Barnard, what's it called? The Barnard Center for Research on Women. And that series is called Nobody is Disposable. And so it's kind of like, nobody is disposable, nobody is disposable. And they, it, this was early on in the Trump years. And so they were addressing some of the, um, you know, healthcare cuts that Trump was trying to institute at the time. Um, one of the videos is called Ableism is the Bane of My Motherfucking Existence. One of them is called My Body Doesn't Oppress Me, Society Does. Um, so center and crit bodies as whole and here and present and active in the world and that, um, no, you can't just throw us away. Exactly. Um, I want to thank you so much, Nomi. We'll hear from you again shortly. And I'd like to invite India into our conversation, India Harvell. So please turn on your microphone and your camera. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> India, I'd like for you to share an audio description of yourself for our participants. Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm a thick African-American cisgendered woman. I have long black dreadlocks. I'm wearing a dark purple dress and a dark purple headscarf. I'm wearing dangly pink earrings, but you probably can't see them um, because of my locks. And I'm sitting on a gray couch with just a plain white wall behind me. Great. India, your movement work focuses on eliminating isolation. And could you share with us how movement helps our body minds shift from isolation? Yeah, I'll say a few things about that. Um, I think movement, not just dance, but movement even more broadly can help us confront isolation. I remember being a baby crip and watching my first couple of sins performances and just hearing other chronically ill disabled folks uh, people of color sharing similar experiences as mine and to hear how they had come into loving their bodies more and to see them move 
in loving ways with themselves and embody and touch themselves and come into their sexuality was everything for me. And so I was struck by the power of um, how witnessing that is its own kind of medicine. And of course, then moving myself as a dancer, as a performer, as a mover, um, has helped me tap into a sense of connection with other movers. And when I talk about movers, I don't mean just professional dancers. I don't even like the concept of professional dancers. I think if you can breathe, you can dance. And so connecting to other bodies in motion has been a place where I've found a sense of belonging and connection. And I love that both the things that I dance about, whether that's like being with breath or being with pain or learning to love my body, a lot of people can relate to those things um, and that can bring us together. And then there's those folks who don't relate to those things, which is also awesome because I think SINS has been a place where we've gotten to learn that all body minds are different and that's okay. And that's a thing that we have in common. We're all different and we're all working to love ourselves and learn how to be together and support and understand the differences in our body minds and how we can work together. And so I think um, many pathways where movement has helped me with isolation. Absolutely, thank you so much, India. Um, and in the spirit of collaboration, I would love to invite Antoine Hunter into our conversation as a panelist. Um, Antoine, I invite you to turn on your camera and unmute yourself if that's comfortable. Welcome. Um, Antoine was one of the dancers featured in the film. Antoine, could you offer or sign a description of yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm an African American. And I am Cherokee and Blackfoot. I'm a milk chocolate brown skin color complexion with black ebony beard, full beard. I've got dreaded hair. They're about, uh, they're locks. I've got a black shirt on, a t-shirt with a dashiki print on the right side. And my background is a dark blue curtain. I stole it from my shower. <laughs> Thank you, Antoine. And I'm, yes, sure. Um, so listening to India, I'd like to invite you to share with us a little bit, what do you know to be true about the body-mind connection for dancers, especially deaf dancers? Yeah, really. When we think about deaf people and whether or not being deaf is a disability or not, really, it doesn't matter. It's about what is your identity. And we talk about the idea of listening in different ways. There's not only one way to listen through the ears, but you can also listen with your heart. And It doesn't matter about stereotypes that other people have about us dancing. We can, it's not about having a specific beat. Each person has their own beat. And there are other ways of listening to yourself. For example, you know, mother's instincts, animal instincts, those are ways of listening. So we also have deaf instincts as well. And that's how we respond. We respond through movement and dance. And I encourage people to listen to themselves more through movement, not always through words, but through the movement and using movement as a way to communicate with oneself and to communicate with the community. Beautiful, thank you so much, Antoine. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more when we come back around. I wanna to get to Maria, our final panelist, for today. And Maria, I invite you to turn on your camera and unmute yourself so participants can see you. Hi. Hi. 
Maria is a light-skinned brown woman in a wheelchair, and she has shoulder-length dark brown hair that is in a ponytail on the left side of her head. And we can't see what she's wearing because all we see is her head. <laughs> um, so welcome, Maria. Thank you. you. Are, yeah, you are the first person we see in the film and who we also hear. Um, right. Um, your performance notes that you learned about sex and love on your own. So I have to ask you, what are two points or reminders you could share with a younger Maria or with other Crips about sex and love? Are there any differences between them for you? Oh my gosh. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to represent Sins and uh, watching the film um, at the beginning of the program. It's always, for me, it's exhilarating to, to see not only myself in film, but to see my peers. And it's just, it's just wonderful. So uh, to answer your question, if I were to, to speak to a young Maria, or actually to even the message to young disabled people today, um, I would like to say that the first thing I want you to know is that you already have everything that you need to give and receive pleasure, to love and to feel loved. Um, I did learn about sex and love on my own, uh, more than likely because I grew up disabled in a culture that oppressed disabled people even more so than, than the culture here. I grew up in Latin America. So um, I also think that most of us as disabled people, whether we grew up disabled or became disabled later, we are forced to learn or relearn about sex and, and sexuality and crypt desirability on our own because we are so oppressed by ableism that, um, that we don't have a chance. We have to, if we don't learn on our own, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be given the opportunity to, to reach that point of intimacy even within each other because that's how oppressed we are. And um, I think that when we speak about sex and love and uh, you know, the piece that the little excerpt of the piece hunger, which is what you witnessed in the show, I speak about, um, sometimes confusing sex and love. And I think that um, as I have gotten older and wiser, um, my understanding, I've come to understand sex and love and um, a sex as the hunger of the body, that, that desperate hunger that makes us desire and want somebody and touch and kiss and claw and, and be recognized as a sexual being. That is how I see that the sex as hunger of the body whereas I see love as the hunger of the soul. You know, that desire to be loved and accepted, the need to, to feel intimate with somebody else's soul. Um, so that's, I hope that that sort of wraps up your question without going overboard because I could really, really, really talk on and on and on about everything that, that this question embraces. Absolutely. And we're going to ask you several more questions. <laughs> so thank you so much for um, Maria. Um, I'd like to invite Nomi to join us again and to turn on their screen and microphone. And as you do that, I want to note, um, I'm going to pause for our interpreters. Great. I also wanted to note that each of the panelists thus far has mentioned some aspect of being whole and wholeness being that disability justice principle. And I think it's a really stunning reminder of crip brilliance in action. And so know me, the focus of the next Sins and Valid show is climate chaos. Could you share a little bit about how and why that topic was selected and maybe give us a little glimpse into what you're planning for your performance? Sure. Yeah, I mean, for years, Patty Byrne has been saying, you know, in 20 years, our descendants are going to say, why weren't you only talking about climate chaos all the time? Um, and so, you know, Patty's been tracking this and then we're watching how we're impacted and we are being impacted. And members of our cast, people on this call right now are being impacted by climate chaos. And, um, you know, COVID is in some ways a result of climate chaos. And when we look at 
people with environmental um, disabilities, like multiple chemical sensitivities, in some ways, it's like we become the canary in the coal mine, like we're the first people to be the most impacted by the damage that's being done to the planet. And then at the same time, so many of us are institutionalized or isolated in ways where we don't have control over our movements. We don't have people who are going to prioritize our wellness and safety in the event of catastrophe. And so, and we've seen that again in recent times with the fires and with power outages and, you know, it's crips who have to take care of each other. And so it feels really important um, and also just, you know, life saving work to be making this conversation bigger in the culture so that we can know what's happening and what we're in for and, and how we're gonna face it. And, you know, the history of Sins and Valid Performances, it was established as a project about disability and sexuality. And then when we're talking about ourselves and our wholeness, that just, I, it just like blows out to really huge proportions, so. Um, and then for my performance, um, I'm a singer and I'm in a band called The Beauty and my band is gonna have a recorded track. They're really amazing musicians and I'll be singing along with it live. Um, and it's kind of this like queen bee honey thing, but it's also talking about fatness and the ways that fatness gets scapegoated for being like over consumers when really it's like industry that's like pulling out the fat of the land and like, and then blaming us for, you know, creating overconsumption and, um, but then also being like kind of talking about bees as like workers, but then also just like so into the pleasure of what they're doing and that fatness in a lot of ways, I feel like gets shamed and scapegoated for being pleasurable. Like it's like this, like more body to feel pleasure with. And so it's kind of both a reclamation, it's a reclamation of pleasure in the midst of collapse. Absolutely. Yeah, and you always have the most amazing costumes. So I'm very excited to see what your um, vision will look like in um, action for the performance. Um, and for those of you who are with us now, Nomi was the person who was um, described as being dressed up as a bird and was doing a lot of vocal um, work and performing in the film. So thank you so much, Nomi. I want to bring um, India back into the space as part of our panel and um, invite you to turn on your camera. Thank you. You know, um, India, I remember reading on your website um, your description of the movement work that you do. And you write, quote, warming up our bodies with an awareness of connecting to the earth. And I really loved how that connects to Sins and Valid's um, upcoming show around climate chaos. But I also wanted to ask you if you could talk with us about how you connect the body-mind to earth, especially when there's realities of how the earth is being negatively impacted. So through gentrification, specifically in the Bay Area, but also in the movement for Black Lives on the planet. Wow, this is such a great question. And I feel like in a lot of ways, um, a, a lot of the work for me as a mover is about decolonizing our bodies. And the earth is like a collective body for us. And so I see these two as being very linked. And um, decolonizing ourselves from white, cis, heteronormative, able-bodied control um, means reclaiming our relationship to ourselves and to the earth. And um, separating us from the land is a part of how we were colonized and how um, we were separated from a source of power. So a lot of cultures, indigenous cultures, have deep connection to land and ancestors um, and bodies. Um, and the breaking of that was very important in order to control us. And so I think understanding the indigenous people whose stolen lands you live or dance upon is an important piece of this work understanding what lands you may have been ripped away from through colonization is important. 
and then figuring out how, given that, how do I connect genuinely to the land that I find myself on? Was that through displacement, through migration? Am I on my native land? But how do I connect to this place here and now? And when you think about this inside of uh, people of African descent, understanding the legacies of chattel slavery and dealing with how we've been spread across the globe, how we connect to or don't connect to each other, like all of that work, I think you bring it to the dance floor. And then you dance with that grief, you dance with that confusion, you dance with that rage, and you dance with the reclamation of yourself and of the land. And you know, you dance with your grief about gentrification and the displacement yet again of communities of color and the shift of neighborhoods, you know, how we mourn what has happened in the mission district and the cultures that are um, no longer vibrantly represented there and, you know, honoring them and connecting back to what has happened and what, who was there before and what is now lost. So I think, you know, bringing all of those things in to how we're connecting to earth is an important part of that reclamation work. Yeah, and I think you remind us of the disability principle of interdependence, right? And oftentimes we hear that in the, con the context of other people. And I think this is a really beautiful reminder of how we're also interdependent with the planet, with Mother Earth with space and time and all that great stuff. Um, we will um, talk to you in a moment, India. Thank you so much. I want to invite Antoine back and invite him to turn on his camera and microphone to, and join us. And I'd love to talk to Antoine a little bit more about movement. Great. And so, Antoine, um, there's a historical legacy of dance and movement specifically for and of Black people and their bodies, and it's very, very deep. And I wanted to hear from you as a Black and Indigenous person born and raised in the Bay Area, what dance has meant to the movement for Black lives. And I have a couple of other questions. I'm just going to ask all three. <laughs> I'll remind you of them if we need to. But what does dance mean for the movement for Black lives? How has dance become a part of the revolutionary uprising around equity and justice? And why do you believe dance is connected and continues to connect these topics? Sure, sure, yes. First, I want to say hello again. First, I want to clarify, I'm from Oakland, California, the home of the Black Panthers and the Black Panther movement. And I want to show homage to that whole land and that whole area and that origin that really shows uh, the Black culture, that the family is very important. Community is very important to who we are. You know, our Black and brown skins are one thing that really, um, really a hu huge part of Sins and Valid and the work that we do together. And BIPOC, BIPOC individuals, you can see naked, BIPOC individuals performing on stage. We're revealing ourselves, we're showing ourselves to the world and that is powerful. It's not easy to do that. Movement of our everyday bodies. Many people say brown is not pure. Black and black bodies are not pure bodies. They, th they see the white skin as the purity, the goal. But no, black is the earth. Brown is the earth. They are just as pure as white bodies. And Sins and Ballad shows that. And related to Black Lives Matter, wow. What a representation. Um, it's finally showing that through movements, we cannot just shove our community aside. Historically, 
we've been just shoved to the side. And we are showing now the connection between our history and how, how much change has happened. We're starting to unpack all of that identity and showing the world that. And I think dance has the power to do that, it has the power to heal, has the power to communicate those important messages to everyone. Dance has the power to bring people together, many, many different activisms, uh, activist movements together. As BIPOC people, we need to come together and move together and it's a beautiful thing. So I just wanna recognize that definitely and honor, you know, as disabled, as a deaf person, we are pure, we are beautiful and we are brilliant. Absolutely. And so much of the videos that I see coming out from the Black Lives Matter movement has been an incorporation of dance, whether it be voguing from certain houses or people just in joyful movement of their bodies. Um, can you share with us a little bit about how you see dance being that connector in times of rage and times of uprising that really brings people together um, with their bodies in a completely new way? Oh, absolutely. I know that when you move your body, you're expressing yourself. You're taking a risk. You're allowing people to view you, to see you. One thing I really appreciate about Sins and Ballad is, again, is the creativity of the space, of making that space available. How that can be a voice for our celebration of who we are. We can dance all of the emotions, whether it be happy and joyful or sad or angry. If we hold in all of that, that's when it just starts to diminish. When you can't express yourself, I feel like, it feels like that light kind of goes off when you can't express yourself. Dance can be the voice for many people. Movement can do that. I'm not usually one to get involved directly with street protest and uh, that kind of direct action, but I feel like through my movement, through my dance, that's a form of protest. And those waves of expression come through me through, and the messages come through me. And I can express all of the emotions I need to through that. At the same time, it's a celebration. It's a celebration through art itself. Thank you. And just a reminder for folks watching Black Lives Matter. And in the future, there are Black people. Thank you, Antoine. I'd like to invite Maria to join us again. And I want to invite Maria to talk to us a little bit more about sensuality and sexuality. And I'd like to talk um, with you a little bit about how does pleasure and sensuality play a role in resisting oppression and building a world where all people can thrive? I love that question. I love that question simply because disabled people are hot. We are sexy. And while the world expects us to just roll over and die and hate our bodies, loving ourselves is one of the most revolutionary acts of advocacy. Self-love automatically fights ableism because the minute that we begin loving ourselves, the non-disabled world will begin to realize the value of our humanity. When we love ourselves, we make it harder for the oppressor to keep oppressing us. We make it harder for ableism to hurt us, to destroy the validity of our humanity. I am a firm believer in the power of self-love and the power of our crypt sexuality. Owning our sensuality is power. 
recognizing our hotness is powerful, sharing our sensuality with the world, expressing it, recognizing it, letting it be known is powerful. Right now we live in a society that wants to kill disabled people. We are forgotten, we are abandoned, we are thrown into institutions. Um, the last thing that people are gonna think is that we are sexual and sensual beings. So when we claim it, when we own it, when we declare ourselves to be, when we live it and profess it, that is the kind of revolutionary, rebellious advocacy that really changes the world and the way disabled people are seen. Creativity in itself is, 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 is a sensual power. Uh, because when we use our personal creativity and the force of our art to demonstrate who we are as human beings, as disabled people, as sexy disabled people, we are sending a message, a message that we deserve to be here. We are automatically fighting ableism just by loving ourselves, by learning to love the body we're in. That's one thing that the non-disabled world doesn't understand. To them, it's shocking that we can even conceive the thought of self-love, much less sensuality, hotness, sexiness, the power to flirt. Uh, one of the pieces that I did for Sins, I'm not sure I remember when, but it's called Flirting Lessons. And in that piece, I remind people that confidence is sexier than the body. And I really truly believe that, but I also think that most scripts have been conditioned to believe otherwise. Most of us have been so oppressed by ableism that we have internalized all the fear and anger and all the issues that non-disabled people have with us. All we have to do is embrace it, keep embracing it, keep declaring you're sexy, keep claiming it, keep flirting. Never forget how powerful you are. Never forget that self-love really does fight ableism. We need your um, recording of saying that over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> a little inner loop. Self-love automatically fights ableism. Self-love automatically fights ableism. Thank you, Maria. I have a few more questions and would love to um, then go to our question and answers um, that our participants have asked. So just a reminder, if you do have questions for any of our panelists, you are able to send those into the question and answer box in the Zoom platform. So I wanna invite um, Nomi back and uh, have Nomi share with us how um, their creative work is an extension of your sexual expression. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, well, geez, I feel like Maria just said a lot of really great things about this. Um, I was just thinking about just the way that, you know, sexuality is a creative impulse and it's the desire to create connection and to create pleasure and to create life. And, um, and so I think sexuality like naturally can feed creative impulses. I also think sometimes when you're sexually fulfilled, you don't necessarily need to be creative in other ways. And I think that sometimes having had a history of being um, not really having access to expressing my sexuality in a lot of ways, led to me being like obsessively creative and like all of my sexual drive went into creating art and I could express all of that passion and longing in my voice and I can draw pictures of what I'm dreaming about or thinking about or or the things I'm angry about or you know it's like you get to work out all the stuff that you might want to work out with your body or with other people in that way you can work it out in these different um, creative forms and I've always been really you know multimedia in the kind of art that I create so it's kind of just how it wants to come out in the moment and letting that be a really kind of organic process. Yeah. Can you share a little bit more about how that's connected to your work around voice and using your voice in a sexual and creative way? Yeah, I mean, so much of how I work with and think about and feel into voice is about vibration and where it resonates in my body, how it resonates in the space that I'm in, 
being able to receive other people in that way through the vibration of their voice. And there's a lot about that that's very sensual and sometimes feels sexual as well. Um, yeah, and really just like when I talk about like authentic expression, because I think there's so much, whether you've been told that you're a bad singer or a good singer, like so much gets built up around how we then feel controlled in how we're able to express ourselves. So when I talk about authentic expression and like you feel something, you let it arise, you let it out, it lands somewhere, it's part of the world. And that kind of like reciprocal flow with your environment, with the world is also very similar in a lot of ways to the flow of sexuality when we're engaging with our sexuality with other people or with our environment. Yeah, I really like your um, human sexual response <laughs> explanation better than Masters and Johnson's. Oh, you know, the language. <laughs> so thank you, Nomi. I'd like to ask the same question to India. So India, I welcome you back um, and to share your camera. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit, a bit with us about how your creative work is an extension of your sexual expression. I will say tag what Maria said, tag what Nomi said. Um, and I'll add, like, I think dance is like a form of sex with your clothes on. And I don't just mean um, when I'm dancing in an explicitly sexual way only. I think creativity is a very sexual thing for me. Like the act of creating is very uh, sensual and stimulating and I'm making visuals and I'm using all of my senses in this really engaged way. And dance is the way I understand the world. I feel like dance feels like my first language sometimes. And I go to dance to figure everything out in my life. So on the dance floor, I took back my sense of ownership of my sexuality and said, no, you don't get to own my body. I said, fuck you to being exotified by the white gaze. I reclaimed my body on the dance floor through tears, through shouting, through all kinds of things, myself after sexual violence. You know, I got to figure out what I really liked, what I wanted, what I need sexually, what I'm curious about, what I'm attracted to. And then I got to fall in love with my own sexuality and my own sense of hotness. And for me, dance in and of itself is like a turn on. And so, you know, the links are numerous. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, India. Um, I'd like to invite Antoine to answer the same question. So Antoine, if you could share your camera with us. And the question is, okay, hey, sure. um, how is your creative work an extension of your sexual expression? Hmm. Wow. <laughs> I'm a two-spirit person. And I think that my creative works uh, have really saved my life. Because so often I couldn't identify or express that aspect of my being. And when I founded Ur Urban Jance, da Jazz Dance Company, It was after working with Sins Invalid that I realized that that work and working with that group, there were lots of things that were talked about that people don't often want to talk about. You know, even the body, people don't want to talk about the deaf struggle or deaf people in prison. And I know that there are lots of overlaps of different issues that happen to deaf people and deaf experiences. And so a lot of times those things are seen as separate issues, but I see them as all happening at the same time. And we don't talk about discrimination. And so the Urban Jazz Dance Company, we really want to learn and show people how to save their lives. And 
really, I think the question you offer is so good. It's so deep. <laughs> and I feel like my answer could go on for so long. Um, but to try and give you a short answer, I think that dance saved my life. Pleasure, sensuality, increased my self-esteem, increased my drive for living. And I'm constantly learning about my own movements, you know, my movement vocabulary, if you will. You know, society often tries to prevent me from loving myself and from understanding myself. And I often need access before I'm able to practice my art, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's a long process of learning, learning about my own sexuality and saving myself along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Antoine. I wanna to turn to our participant questions. And this first question I'm going to direct towards Nomi to answer. And the question is, I'm curious about the choice to use beauty in the name of the film. For context, I've struggled with the use of beauty language in progressive spaces. Because as an ugly woman, my ugliness is so central to understanding my own lived experiences of discrimination, inclusion, even in progressive communities. So Nomi, could you join us and offer a response if you have one to this question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this question and I really want to honor the experience of the person who asked it and say your experience of your own, um, the way that you're treated in the world based on how you're perceived as beautiful or ugly is super powerful. And, um, you know, there's an organization called Reclaim Ugly that's been doing a lot of work around uh, uglification, which is a tool of oppression. And I have also experienced many things by many people in the world would consider me ugly. And it has been a lifelong for me, part of my both aesthetic and artistic approach to life and also my spirituality is really um, oriented towards beauty and oriented towards understanding what beauty is outside of capitalism and the commodification of bodies and experiences and that for me like finding beauty in a moment like having a tree like shaking its leaves at me in a really seductive way is like such an awe-filled experience and so when I talk about beauty that's what I'm talking about is that kind of feeling of just heart expansion awe that it can be from visual stimulus it can also be just a fully visceral experience of the world. And um, I, it's really important to me to experience myself as beautiful. And as I get older, you know, and accepting, you know, I look all kinds of ways, you know. Um, I'm not trying to be a supermodel or anything even close to that. But a lot of my experience of beauty is the, is the environment that I create around myself. Um, and so, yeah, I, I want disabled people to feel that they have access to beauty um, and we get to make each other feel beautiful. And Patty Byrne has a quote that says, beauty always, always recognizes itself. And that really resonates to me in my disabled experience. Thank you so much, Nomi. We have another um, participant question and I'd like for India to join us. I think we're gonna switch interpreters. Great. So India, the um, participant question is, I would love to hear your comments and thoughts about the acceptance process and grieving process with acquiring your disability and all the thinking about stereotypes that exist. So um, such a juicy question. And I think um, a lot of times something I like to say is that I think this process is ongoing and lifelong. You know, some people are born with a particular disability. Others of us acquire disabilities at different points in our lives. And um, what we can do in our bodies from day to day, from moment to moment can be changing. And at any given time, we can experience a sense of grief or a sense of loss um, and come into places of acceptance. And I think sometimes people think that you arrive 
right? Like now I accept myself and it's all easy and it's, it's, I'm just there. And that's not been my experience. I definitely go through cycles. I even just a little while ago, I had a period of not having the kinds of particularly disabling migraines that I can experience. And then suddenly out of nowhere, I had three or four weeks where they were just every day again. And I hit a sense of grief again, even though that's been a part of my reality for 11 years. Um, so it's just, I think that process is constantly unfolding. And I think, um, I think the other thing that a lot of disabled folks in conversations with me have shared is that um, people try to prescribe how you should move through that and what that should look like. And I think you have to give yourself permission to figure out what that needs to look like for yourself and give yourself permission for that to be a messy, long process or a short process. You know, grief is tricky and it looks really different at different times and for different folks. And then I think about this question about stereotypes. Um, I, I, if I'm understanding the question properly, um, sort of what it means that you have this, this, this disabled body and how people in the world might treat you or how people perceive you. And I say, you know, uh, part of me is just like, um, there's a way, there, there are times when I felt really, overwhelmed by the kinds of gaze that people put on me that didn't feel like my experience at all. When I started using wheelchair, people were like, oh, that's so sad, you're wheelchair bound. I was like, no, this is freedom. I can leave my home. This is amazing. Fuck you. Don't put that on my experience. And so being really, you know, understanding that there's going to be times where it's harder for you to find that strength in yourself, finding community, finding books, finding resources, of people who can affirm um, more about how you're experiencing your reality can be an important tool. And then um, letting go and just knowing that stereotypes are not truth. Sometimes they hold up for some folks and a lot of times they don't. And deciding that you get to choose your own narrative and your own path um, and not letting that bog you down as much as you can. Yeah. Thank you so much, India. Um, yeah, grief is a shapeshifter. <laughs> so thank you for reminding us, us of that. We are going to put in the chat box a few different links to where you can support Sins Invalid, join their newsletter to stay up to date on their upcoming performances, and where you can purchase your own digital or hard copy of the Disability Justice Primer. I'd like to invite Dasam Na from Nobody is Disposable to offer us some information and a call to action. Dasam, could you share your screen and unmute yourself? Hello, uh, this is Dasam. I am not going to be on video today, unfortunately. Um, however, I am here to share some um, exciting news from care rationing, from our care rationing campaign, uh, which is um, care rationing is uh, what happened in New York and what happened in Italy and what has been happening also many times in the past uh, is uh, disabled people and elders are excluded from care, are not prioritized when it comes to uh, giving medical care uh, during COVID uh, crisis right now. Um, so, um, after campaigning um, with our care rationing group, uh, we got the new uh, guidelines from California that were assigned by Governor Newsom um, in June, uh, which were different from the previously released ones uh, in that uh, disabled people and elders were not going to be discriminated um, in uh, medical uh, situations regarding COVID. Um, However, those guidelines are one thing, and uh, another thing is for individual hospitals to implement those guidelines. So now we ask 
everyone to pressure individual hospitals such as Kaiser and Sutter Health um, to implement those guidelines and actually commit to not discriminating against disabled people and elders. Uh, so uh, you can do so by going to um, uh, Senior and Disability Actions uh, Twitter or Facebook and reposting um, the articles and um, no body is disposable uh, posts um, that are um, adding the Kaiser and Soder Health um, 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 management administration. Um, you can also find um, all the other details of how to get engaged in this action in the document that is going to be shared in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dasam, for joining us. Um, and I just want to remind people um, that there are links in the chat box for you to stay connected. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you to our panelists, Nomi, Antoine, Maria, and India, our interpreters, Annie and Ebony, and our behind the scenes folks at Longmore, Superfest, Urban Jazz, Lisa, Emily, Zana, and Reagan. Thank you so much. We look forward to the future and please have a great weekend. Bye. Love you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. White text on a black background reads, thank you for watching. Please visit us on Facebook at SFSU Disability, on Twitter at Longmore Inst, or online at longmoreinstitute.sfsu.edu.